basically, I, I want to literally share with you some of the lessons that we've learned in Marin County over the last uh, 11 years now. Uh, started the Carbon Project back in 2007. Um, a group of us came together really concerned about the climate change question, and, and, but also saw an opportunity in that for our producers in West Marin County. And our, our thought at the time was, okay, well, we know we can sequester carbon in our agricultural systems. Could our, our urban sector support that effort on our ag lands? And so basically all the major organizations, ag organizations in the county came together, uh, myself and some, some others, um, and formed the Marin Carbon Project. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to give us a little bit of vocabulary when I start this because Although this seems overly complex, for me, it was in, in encountering this concept of general systems theory that finally gave me the language to explain what I was seeing on the ground as just a dirt poor grass farmer before I went back to grad school to try to, to get at kind of the, what is, what's really underlying these processes that I'm seeing on the ground, but I don't really understand what's going on. So, um, just very briefly, general systems theory suggests that systems, such as our farm systems, they're either changing or they're staying the same, right? Pretty fundamental. But it's, it begs the question, okay, so how do, we, how do we keep systems static, if you will, sustainable? And then how do we drive system change? What are the mechanisms we can use to drive system change? So system stasis or homeostasis is really maintained by a set of deviation dampening feedback, negative, what we call negative feedbacks, not because they're bad, but because they stop the system from, from running outside of its, basically its mean behavior. So it'll, you know, it'll fluctuate a little bit around that mean, but it's basically operating within some range of, of deviation, if you will. Um, on the other hand, if we want to change the system, we have to, engage with this process of deviation amplifying positive feedbacks, not necessarily because they're good, but in the sense that as these changes happen, they provoke other changes. And so the system begins to move in some direction, um, either up or down, which is a relative concept, right? How do we perceive that change? Is it good or is it bad? So obviously a good example of a negative feedback is a Thermostat, room gets too hot, the heat turns off, the room gets too cold, the heat turns back on, and we, we keep the system moving around some central tendency we call comfortable. On the other hand, a positive feedback, and we see this now happening at the global scale, a positive feedback begins to amplify change. So here we have Arctic sea ice in 1979, and here we have Arctic sea ice in 2015. What's happening here? We're seeing more exposed open water, right, in, at the end of the summer. And, and what's that doing? It's exposing dark water, which is absorbing more solar radiation, right? So the, the warming of the planet, which is melting that Arctic ice, is exposing more open water, which is warming and driving further heating of the planet. So rather than a thermostat cooling the planet now, we see this essentially runaway warming. As it warms, it warms more. Not a good sign. So when we look at global atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide, we see on the one hand this equilibrial intraannual flux. Every year there's a little up and down of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and that's, that's basically a homeostatic condition. But because we're pumping, actively pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we're bending that curve out of that homeostatic position. It's driving the system in a direction of change, which, which probably is not a good thing. If we, if we go back 800,000, even 3 million years, we see, we see a flux in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which looks very much like an equilibrium state. We see an up and a down, up and, up and down, but it's all, it's all moving around some median state. We're, we're really fluxing between 190 and 290 parts per million for the last three million years or so. All of a sudden, however, we're up here. 
Now that should be very alarming to all of us. That is clearly not a homeostatic state. The system is changing radically and very quickly, essentially moving out of the bounds of anything we as a species have ever experienced. So it's definitely time to think about what's going on here. Now some folks have suggested that we started to see a rise in atmospheric carbon dioxide around the time we started intensifying our agriculture. Around the time we started beginning to cultivate the soil and began to use fire more broadly as a tool in ecosystem management, right? So we do see this interesting historical trend in carbon dioxide. And then we see this little blip, which is, we, we recognize as the, the little ice age um, in, what was that, 1490s or something. But now we're up here again. Very, very strange phenomenon. So we know that, that cultivation is definitely implicated in adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Um, so agriculture has definitely played a role in this equation. We're talking, you know, very large quantities of carbon that have been released from the soil, soil organic matter oxidizing, returning to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So it's clearly a factor, but on the other hand, Agriculture is also very vulnerable to this climatic change we're seeing. When we move things out of the realm of the predictable, agriculture definitely is going to suffer. And, and on the other hand, on the, finally, we see the opportunity here for agriculture because enhancing soil carbon is actually the only viable option we have to draw down that surplus carbon from the atmosphere. So it's that opportunity that the Marine Carbon Project was formed to try to engage with, right? or to, to realize. So this is what we're talking about here, this, this rapidly rising curve of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and yet we have this intra-annual flux, this homeostatic condition, which is about six parts per million every year that growing plants, particularly northern hemisphere forests, northern hemisphere phytoplankton, is sucking down six parts per million of carbon dioxide every spring, every spring, when those trees leaf out, they're inhaling all that CO2, right? And then, of course, they exhale in the fall when all that leaf is dropped and begins to decompose and, and the soil biology kicks in and, and exhales all that carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. So what's the mechanism here? Well, obviously it's photosynthesis um, and, and just kind of helpful to remember, because we know this but we don't always think about it, that all of the carbon and carbohydrates, that is the products of agriculture, is coming out of the air, right? So very, very interesting to think about that in this context. Um, so plants, of course, are sucking in CO2, they're pulling uh, water and minerals from the soil, and then they're producing the products of agriculture, the sugars, the cellulose, the lignans that are the products of agriculture. And of course, depositing some of that carbon back to the soil surface as detritus when they die, and also directly exuding carbon compounds and sugars directly into the soil ecosystem and supporting that soil biology, which is supplying them with the minerals and, and water they need. So my friend John Wick, co-founder of the Marine Carbon Project, likes to define agriculture as the art of moving carbon between carbon pools to produce the products of agriculture. So what do we mean about, by carbon pools? Well, there are five major carbon pools on the planet, right? And we, we become very familiar with this one. We're burning this deeply sequestered carbon, as quickly as we can apparently, we're oxidizing that, turning it into carbon dioxide, and we're pumping this, this number keeps growing of course, this is what we're doing. We're forcing that atmospheric carbon with the oxidation of this deeply sequestered fossil carbon, right? This stuff was laid down millions of years ago. It's been out of sight, out of mind for a very long time, and now we're burning it as fast as we can. So that in turn is driving, of course, increases in carbon in the, in the oceans which is driving ocean acidification. And all of this is driving global warming due to the influence of these greenhouse gases on the atmosphere. And that in turn is warming the oceans. So where do we park this extra carbon that's gonna do us some good? Well, a lot of folks have put their money on forest systems, which for folks in the East and maybe this region might work very well. Anybody who's been watching the news and watching what's happening to our Western forests uh, knows that putting carbon, banking on forest carbon as a carbon sink um, is probably not a very good bet in the Western US at this point. Um, we're seeing drying, warming conditions that are driving larger, more intense forest fires. That carbon is going right back into the atmosphere where it came from. So where does that leave us? 
it leaves us actually engaging with the second largest carbon pool on the planet, which is the soil. The nice thing about soil is when we increase soil carbon, all kinds of good things happen, unlike some of the other carbon pools on the planet. So the ARS, the Agricultural Research Service, has recognized carbon as the keystone element, key to agricultural productivity and resilience, right? This is now, you know, you go through our agricultural school textbooks and you're gonna be hard pressed to find carbon, certainly historically, but it's beginning to come back to center stage where it really belongs. And of course, organic agriculture, its origins are fundamentally rooted in the whole question of organic matter and the role of organic matter in soil fertility. So, not to completely bore you to death, but this is just some data that was published in 2016, looking at the implications of stopping emissions, stopping the burning of fossil fuels, as compared to stopping emissions and engaging with active drawdown of atmospheric carbon dioxide through biological processes. So this is where we are. This is the trajectory we're on, this yellow line. Uh, it's not a good one. And we don't see much sign that we're going to get off of that trajectory anytime soon. If we really stop burning fossil fuels, if we reduce our emissions by 3% or 6% a year, we could potentially by the end of the century be down around where we are right now. Um, if we engage drawdown, if we engage this biological process of fixation, we could potentially actually get down to about 350, which some people think is a safe level. We could probably argue about that. Um, so with this, in this context, the Marine Carbon Project set out to test the, this hypothesis that we could, in fact, increase soil carbon through management and that we could measure it because we knew if we couldn't measure it, we wouldn't have a story to tell. So in 2008, we decided to add some carbon to the system and then come back and see if we could measure a change. Pretty simple, very simple hypothesis test. How did we add carbon to the system? We put compost out on standing vegetation on grazed rangelands in Marin County, and we replicated that in Yuba County, which is up in the Sierra foothills. So this is compost going out on the Yuba County site. This is put out half an inch of compost. Doesn't sound like much, but it was as much as I thought we could put out without burying the vegetation. We didn't want to bury the vegetation because we knew it wouldn't be able to photosynthesize. So we put out what we thought was the maximum amount we could put because we really wanted to see a change. Uh, so, you know, we put a lot of material out there. So what happened? First year, right away, we saw a significant increase in forage production. We saw a 40% increase in forage production on the coastal site and a 70% increase in forage production on the Foothill site. Foothill site was a drier site. And we think that because of the increased water holding capacity and the, in, from the compost, it made a bigger difference on the drier Foothill site than it did on the coastal site. Now what's interesting is as we follow this data, and we're now in year 10, this is the only published data, what we saw, despite the fact that we only applied compost in year one, we saw this relative increase in, in forage carbon every single year following that one year, first year compost application. We saw a very similar trend in the soil carbon. And this was kind of the home run because we had set out to see if we could achieve a change in soil carbon, and we did. But again, what was exciting was that we saw it not only in the first year, but we saw it in every subsequent year without any further compost addition. It also drew the attention of the cows. So the cows were happier grazing on the, and this is one pasture, so they're choosing, they're selective, selecting the compost treated plots over the control, the two control plots. And when we harvested the forage and we measured the protein in the forage, in fact, we found higher protein on the compost treated plots, which is not a huge surprise, but it supported what we had already observed with the cows. So this slide summarizes what we've learned. And this is sort of the, really the take home message of, of, of what I'm trying to convey here, which is that we put compost on in year one. And of course, the compost has a decay curve. And these are model results, of course. So this goes out 100 years. We don't have 100 years of data. Um, this is the compost going on in year one. But this is the ecosystem response to compost in year one. This is a rising curve. Now, I talked about that positive feedback process, right? So what's happening here? The increased carbon in the soil, particularly as we saw on the foothill site, meant more water held in the soil, right? And higher productivity, which meant we were capturing more carbon from the atmosphere. 
So by adding some carbon to the system, we were now capturing more carbon in the system, and the system continues to capture more carbon on an ongoing annual basis. So this is exactly what we needed. We need a positive feedback process that will counteract that positive feedback process we see going on at the global scale right now, climatically. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about the management of the flow of solar energy through the ecosystem, right? It's in managing for carbon, we're really putting our hand on the most potent lever we have for managing our agricultural ecosystem, which is managing the flow of solar energy from the producer, the plant, all the way through the system to the end products of the system. The energy, the solar energy is gradually dissipating through all, through this food web, all the way to its, its termination, right? So NRCS has pointed this out, that really the best way to enhance soil health is to manage for carbon. Um, we have historically been managing for this bizarre concept called tolerable soil loss. <laughs> sort of an oxymoron in my opinion, but it's, it's what we've been doing. We, can, we know we can afford to lose this much carbon every year, or this much soil every year, and keep the system where it is. Car managing for carbon means we're managing for change. We're managing for an increase in productivity, an increase in water holding capacity, an increase, increase in ecosystem resilience, right? We're managing for this change from a homeostatic state to a steady flow state. So, can livestock can livestock management achieve this deviation amplifying positive feedback to drive system change? Well, anybody was here this morning and, and listened to Greg talk, I think understands that this is certainly possible. Um, so we, we manage the direction of system change, really, by managing the way energy flows into and through the system, right? So, Livestock have gotten a lot of bad press, right? Because of positive feedbacks leading to land degradation through the loss of carbon from those systems, which is the loss of the capacity to process energy, to absorb energy. And that leads to the downward spiral that we recognize as desertification, which is happening at a global scale right now. So, you know, how do we manage this? We manage basically by managing pattern. You know, we manage at the level of what we can see, feel, smell. So we manage patterns as, far, as land managers, but in managing those patterns, we need to be aware of the relationship of those patterns to the underlying processes. So to manage the process, we manage the pattern. And so we manage for the area of land, the number of animals, the time the animals stay on that landscape, and the frequency with which the animals return to the land. Those are basically the tools we have to manage the pattern on the landscape. So an example, and, and Greg showed many this morning, um, we, it's all about managing the scale of that disturbance. That's really what we're talking about. Um, and of course, there are a lot of tools now available to do that. And this is a tumble wheel, again, being used to manage the way, the time those animals are on there, the number of animals is controlled, and their return interval is controlled. So the, the lesson here is that to initiate a virtuous deviation amplifying positive feedback <coughs> within the farm system, we capture more solar energy as carbon and allocate more of that carbon to the soil system, to that long-term durable soil pool. So just kind of a schematic showing what we're, we're doing here, and, and this is exactly what Greg was talking about this morning. The way I would modify this drawing is that these are not e necessarily equal, right? You bring the animals back when the vegetation tells you to bring them back so that you can allocate enough of that above ground biomass to the soil system and begin to build soil carbon underneath that vegetation. And that's how you build the system and how you build productivity and increase your overall production. There are a lot of other ways, however, to increase carbon capture on, on the working landscape. Riparian restoration, at least in our region, happens to be a very potent one. And this is 30 years of photogra photographic evidence from Stemple Creek Ranch in Marin County, going back to 1990, when this was grazed as a single, single unit and had been for over 100 years. Uh, in about 2000, a uh, riparian restoration project was Im implemented. The creek was fenced. 
Um, cattle still grazing there seasonally. Uh, and, and now, 30 years later, we're looking at a, basically a restored riparian system. Um, and you can envision all the carbon that's been accumulated in that system. We also know windbreaks and shelter belts are very effective at capturing carbon. Hedgerows, silvopasture, Greg showed some great examples of that this morning. The integration of livestock and forest systems, riparian forest buffers, and of course, using organic matter additions to build soil carbon is a very quick and easy way to, to achieve that. Um, the implications are pretty graphically shown here. This is from Australia. This side managed for carbon accumulation, this side not. And you can see, begin to understand the, the implications for the water cycle, the hydrology of these systems by managing for carbon accumulation. And this is a, a kind of a remarkable three-year transition uh, on the coast of California. This is a vegetable grower who started with this soil and within three years had built this with compost applications and cover cropping and so forth. So we have stepped into the space we call carbon farm planning, which is basically taking the NRCS conservation planning process and putting carbon at the center of it. And we build a whole farm plan around all the opportunities we can identify for enhanced carbon capture on that landscape. And then we recognize all of the co-benefits that come with, incre with increasing that carbon capture. We've been greatly aided in this work by the, this tool developed by Colorado State University and in collaboration with USDA, um, which recognizes actually quite a few more than 35 practices now and quantifies their carbon benefits based on your particular location. So very, very easy drop-down tool. Um, all based on this, the USDA Blue Book, which was published in 2014, quantifying greenhouse gas fluxes in agriculture and forestry. Um, and here's an example of a, a plan. This is Blake's Landing. Some of you may know it as Strauss Dairy. This is the home dairy. Um, and you can see all the various practices that have been, or will be implemented, or planned. I shouldn't say they've all been implemented um, on this. And, and here's 12 practices laid out in the carbon farm plan, all of them with a carbon benefit or carbon dioxide reduction benefit associated with them. Uh, this is another dairy, it's an 1100 acre dairy, milking about 450 cows, again in Marin County. Um, and this plan is just about done. We're not quite done with it. These folks have also recently received a $750,000 grant from the state of California to convert their flush barn to a dry scrape system, which will be then integrated with their on-site, existing on-site um, compost operation here. Uh, the state of California supporting on-farm projects to reduce uh, methane emissions. Uh, that program is, is a good start. Um, we, think it, we think it's really underestimating significantly what agriculture can do because it's only looking at emissions from manure in storage. It's not looking at all the other opportunities that we've identified in the carbon farm planning process for carbon, uh, atmospheric carbon reduction, soil carbon enhancement. And I'll just skip to that. So this is, this is Albert Strauss again. Um, and he has gone to the point, he's got a methane digester. He's converted his feed truck to electricity. And he figures he's offsetting about 200 gallons of diesel a month by using the methane generated from his manure. And, and what's the payoff for Albert? Well, the payoff is that he's got a sustainability story he wants to tell to the public. And he's, he's adding this story to it. So he's engaging with the Marine Car Carbon Project to help fight climate change, right? He's not making specific claims of any sort, but he's just putting it out there and telling the public what he's up to. Similarly, up in the northeastern part of the state, we're working with a wool producer. And in this case, we were engaged by the fiber shed, and some of you may be familiar with. Fiber shed has is, is got this very intriguing model, looking to re-revivify, I guess, the fiber production system of the US, starting in California, but now actually working internationally, really to, to bring the whole fiber production cycle back home, right? And, and in the process, recognize the important role of agriculture in generating, being part of the, the solution to, to climate change. So with, with uh, Fiber Shed and this producer, we um, developed a carbon farm plan back in 2015. These are the list of practices the producer is interested in. This is the annual greenhouse gas, gas ca capture associated with the implementation of that plan. And then this is the 20 year output, over 100,000 metric tons of CO2 if the plan is implemented, right? 
So we then looked at life cycle assessment. What's the greenhouse gas cost of producing wool, right? So we went to the literature for that and we found this model and we compared it to our carbon farm data and we saw that the ranch could probably offset by six to 10 times its emissions by implementing its carbon farm plan. So we could really start to think about this idea of a climate beneficial agriculture. And in fact, this was recognized by the North Face who purchased this wool on that basis and has launched this climate beneficial beanie. Um, and then I think this quote from the producer is, is really interesting. Lonnie says, I like to think of, the carb of carbon farming and the climate beneficial work that we're doing as a change of thought. So instead of doing things normally, although obviously we're still raising sheep the way it's always been done, we also think about the soil and the land when we're making decisions. Now, to me, that's success because we've changed the thinking of that producer. So, as I said, we've, we've seen an increase in soil water holding capacity associated with our increases in soil carbon. Um, and we can begin to integrate that information into the carbon farm plan by translating that soil carbon into an organic matter content and translating that into increased water holding capacity. So on this 4,500 acre home ranch for this wool producer, with full impl implementation of the plan by year 20, we're looking at over 500 acre feet of addition, additional water holding capacity in those soils. Now in Northeastern California, that's a significant amount of water. So just to summarize this, we're really talking about reversing, totally reversing this unintentional, this is clearly an unintentional effect of our economy. Reversing this unintentional industrial forcing of atmospheric carbon with the intentional, and I mean very intentional, agricultural forcing of soil organic carbon. We can, if we increase this drawdown, this annual drawdown, just a little bit, we can actually begin to bend that curve in the direction we know it needs to go. So implications for um, global warming, of course, are I think pretty clear. I won't spend time on that. Um, I want to share this because I, I want to tell you why I think this is not an unrealistic price for carbon, $100 a ton. Right now in California, it's trading on the cap and trade market for about $13 a ton. Nobody's gonna change their farming practices for $13 a ton. Um, it's probably that works out to about $13 an acre and folks aren't going to get very excited about that. When we start talking about $100 a ton, folks kind of light up. And I think that's actually a little low because this is based on keeping things below 2 degrees centigrade increase. We actually know that 2 degrees centigrade increase is a disaster and we shouldn't go there. We even know that 1.5, which is where we're certainly headed right now, is probably too high. So I think this price is undervalued. And I'm holding out for that. I'm hoping that's where we, we see that go, to the, go there very soon. Um, if you think I'm crazy, well, we're already in California paying well over that for some of these practices to reduce greenhouse gases, right? So the average price of carbon for these various practices being implemented in California right now is $57 a ton. So why is ag looking at four and five dollars a ton on the voluntary market? Okay. So these are some of the existing and emerging, uh, these are actually all existing policies uh, coming out of California for encouraging uh, greenhouse gas reductions through the management of terrestrial ecosystems, through the management of our working lands. Uh, we have the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, which has approved a protocol for compost application to rangelands. I wouldn't re recommend it to anybody at the current price of carbon, it won't pay for itself, but it's there. So if the price goes up, that protocol might become useful. Um, so NRCS has funded a lot of this work. Uh, we partnered with six resource conservation districts in the greater Bay Area over the last couple of years, developing carbon farm plans regionally th with an RCPP grant from NRCS. Um, we see uh, the state agencies, wildlife conservation boards, state coastal conservancy, fish and wildlife have historically funded projects, which as one of their co-benefits, largely focused on fish and other wildlife, but some of the co-benefits there include carbon capture. And so they're now recognizing the role of agriculture in capturing carbon and, and are therefore funding some of the work we're doing. Um, the state last year launched its Healthy Soils Initiative, 
We asked for $20 million, we got seven and a half for the seventh largest agricultural economy in the world, I think it is. Um, we thought that was a little bit insulting, but um, at least it was something. Uh, it was a start. Um, and then the, the Air Resources Board in California is releasing in the next month or so its new scoping plan in which terrestrial carbon really for the first time is being recognized as a critical part of the state's greenhouse gas reduction goal. So we're working now in 26 of California's 98 resource conservation districts. Uh, we're also partnering with the resource conservation districts up in Washington State and now Colorado. And we're really, you know, this effort uh, in one form or another needs to be global to be successful. So, you know, we're doing what we can. Um, so I'll, I'll stop with this and just say, I think, you know, the good news is that all that extra CO2 in the atmosphere can be transformed in a way that's beneficial and most particularly producing food, fuel, flora, and fiber and banking that as soil organic matter. And that the, the results of doing that include yield, yield increases, soil health, and lots and lots of other ecosystem benefits. And finally, we see poised on the horizon out there, not too far away, some emerging economic opportunities for agriculture. And I think that's it. <laughs>